Okay. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. And uh, welcome to a new year and a new semester. It's the start, it's not the end. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the course is there. on the end times, it's the beginning of the new year. Um, let's pray and then we get started. I'll introduce the course and get started. Could you one of us please pray and we get started? Amen. Amen. All right. So, welcome everyone once again to this new semester, new year, and the course BC213, The End Times. Um, I'm going to introduce the course and then we will get started. And let me just share my screen. Um, so, in uh, the course, the end time. So I have put out the full lecture notes on the classroom. For those of you here, we will also get it printed and give you a copy of it um, until past time to get it printed. Uh, in addition to the course notes uh, on in the class and the class work section, I've also given um, two. Uh, Two additional, uh, uh, sorry, one PDF which is just a chart of the end times, um, and you can it's just an easy way to look at the sequence of events. Then I'm also given two books to read. Uh, it's optional. I'm not saying compulsory to read. Uh, one book is called. Um, uh, it is a book by a person called J. Dwight Pentecost. Um, that book uh, is called the End Times or the Last Things. Um, it's it's a book that is typically used in seminaries to study about the end times. So that whole book is there, but it's a very thick book. I mean, as I said, in print, it'll be a very thick book. Uh, but again, the whole PDF, and you can just, if you want to, you can use it as a reference, you know, read through it and so on. But that's the typical book that's used in seminaries. And it's like a book that's been used for many decades. Almost every seminary uses that book. To talk about the end times, but we will not be using that book. Uh, I will be. I will give you. You know. Uh, 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 you know. I, I'll take you to the course. But that book is a reference. You can read if you're interested. And then there's one more book, which is again. Uh, you can read through it. Um, uh, it's on the timeline, the sequence of events. And so we will be covering that timeline in the course. I'll be going through. Uh, the, the material with you, but these two are like reference books. You can read them if you have time, if you want to study further. Okay, so I've given both the PDFs as well. So, also, what are we going to do in this course? And the main objective in this course is to get a good overview of the end times. So, we're not going to study uh, uh, the book of Revelation in detail or Daniel in detail. That we will do in our third year. In the third year, we'll go Revelation. We'll go through Daniel, uh, all the prophetic sections in Daniel, verse by verse. 
and we'll go through Revelation verse by verse in our third year. But in this course, you want to get a good understanding of what the Bible teaches about the end. It's more like an overview. And the focus is on uh, what are the signs of the end times. So that we want to look at that. It's on the focus on. But we will do an overview of Revelation. That means I will go quickly. Like I say, chapter one, two, and three is about this. I'll give you like a summary. Right? Chapter one, two, and three is like this. Four and five is like this. Six and seven. We won't read every verse, but I'll give you a summary of each chapter as we go through Revelation. In third day, we'll read every verse and go through it in detail. So we'll focus in detail. So we'll do that. So um, this year, uh, in this course, we're doing a, a, a course overview of the end times. We, our goal is to understand the sequence of events. How are the events going to unfold? And what are the signs to look at? You know, bringing us to the end times. And uh, usually I'll break the assessment you know, into three parts and uh, we will grade them based on that. Yeah. Now, uh, I just want to make mention and uh, of Dr. Jack Van um, uh He was, uh, of course, a theologian and a scholar. And he spent maybe, I think, almost 60 or 70 years of his life. He passed away, I think, a few years back at the age of 80 plus. But he spent maybe 60 years of his ministry preaching on the end times. And then that was his focus, special specialty. So he's, uh, he's written many books and you can go to his website. So if you want to read something, so you can, I would recommend going to his website. Uh, he passed away, but uh, all of his work is there available. And so our next uh, semester, uh, next year, third year, we'll, I'll give you one of his books, a Revelation to be uh, you do. Okay, uh, so I would rec recommend. Now there, are, of course, there are many other people who have written books on Revelation and uh, end times. Now, but uh, instead of trying to read so many different people, you know, one one person is really good who is an expert. Uh, I would point you to uh, Dr. Jack Money Base uh, Resources. Okay, so um, let's get started. Let's go to the introduction uh, uh, and. Um, yeah, I should be able to, uh, you can follow with me uh, on the PDF and we'll also give you the, uh, this in, uh, in uh, print. So as an introduction, first thing is just to know the technical word called eschatology. So eschatology, it simply means the study of last things. Yes, the, and the, the final things, the study of last things. So when somebody says, have you done eschatology? You can say, yeah, we had two courses, one in the second year, one in the third year. The second year, we had a course on the end times. Third year, we studied Revelation and Daniel. So all of that, you know, is put together. We are studying about the last things, the end things, final things. So eschatology simply means study about the last things, end time events and so on. So why should we, you know, why should we study about the end times? And why is this subject so important? Um, some people will say, oh, it is so confusing. I don't want to study. Some will say, Revelation, I cannot understand. So leave it. So, uh, again, some people will say, see, uh, different people are interpreting it differently. You know, so why study? Because everybody is interpreting it differently. Why should we study it? So, so um, it is true. It is true that Book of Daniel, Revelation may not be very easy to understand when you read it the first time. Yeah. And uh, it is true that different people have it having different, that is also true, you understand. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't study. We should make effort um, to go into the scriptures and understand these things and make an effort to study these things, right? 
Um, now, I'm, uh, I've listed here in this introduction uh, some reasons why we should, why is the subject important, studying about the end times, right? So one, the first reason, and you can follow the opinion here, uh, is that God has revealed this to us. If God has made the effort to speak to us about the end times, in fact, my whole book, Revelation, is about the end times. So God has made an effort and He's spoken to us. That means He wants us to discover, He wants us to understand. He didn't say, okay, I'll give you a book, but don't read it because you're not going to understand <laughs> what's the point. I don't think that was the reason. Uh, God gave us the Bible. No, everything in the Bible. He wants us to study. He wants us to understand. It's going to take effort, yes, but He wants us to understand. And in fact, uh, when we look at the Book of Revelation, and uh, the, the Book of Revelation starts off like this: Revelation chapter one, verses one, two, and three. Uh, John writes. He says, "The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave." him to show his servants things which must shortly take place and he sent and signified it by his angel to the servant john who bore witness to the word of god and to the testimony of jesus christ to all things that he saw blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near so notice what he's saying john is saying see the lord jesus revealed this to me I have written it, and blessed is the one, or blessed is the person who reads it, okay? and who listens to the words of this prophecy. So he's not saying, oh, I wrote it, but don't read it. No. Say, I wrote it. You are blessed if you read it, and you, you, know, you hear the words of this prophecy, and you keep it. You follow the instructions, what is given you. So there's a blessing here. In studying about prophecy. Another reason uh, is uh, why we should study about the end times is because God has revealed it to us so that we can be watchful uh, in how we live. And we can be watchful in how we live and make sure that they, uh, we are in the end times and we are very close to the end and God wants us to live right. right? So we can study about it. And we can live watchfully. You know, say, oh, I know we're very close. We're getting close. And uh, we can live uh, our lives well. Because we know that the time, you know, Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 11 to 14, he says, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Mm -hmm. So we're getting closer and closer. So we need to live responsibly. We can't just live casually. We'll be getting closer and closer. Another reason, number three, and this is on page number seven in the, in the lecture notes. Um, number three is because God wants us to be people of hope as we look for the future. See, now we may be going through all kinds of things. But if we know, hey, the future is going to come out like this, God is going to step in. And this is what he has planned for us. You know, we can be people of hope, right? Even though there, there may be at times now, and there may be challenges, there may be struggles, but we know that in the future, God has good things planned for us, right? So we can be people of hope. And, and, and John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, he says, you know, uh, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. So it says we know that when the Lord is revealed, we will be like him. No, we will be changed to be like him. We'll see him as he is, and we have this hope. And because we have this hope, we purify ourselves just as he is pure. A fourth reason why we must study about uh, the end times, why it's important to study, is because we see that uh, we understand God's plan. Oh, 
when Adam and Eve sinned and uh, the world went into sin and all kinds of things happened, it's not the end of everything. God is unfolding his plan and the things he's going to do. And in the end, everything is going to come out well. Right? Otherwise, we'll be sitting with all these questions. Why did God let this happen? Why was like this? Why is like the world is like this? All that we'll be sitting with those questions. But right now, if we understand what the what God is going to do, and right? He is going to make new heavens and new earth. He is going to bind Satan and all the demons and get them out of the way. He is going to make all things well. Oh, then we know it's a plan, plan of God. Let's we understand God's glorious plan. He's going to put all things under his feet. He's going to conquer death and so on. Uh, two reasons. One, uh, number five, is because when we study about the end time so that we can be actively proclaiming the gospel to the ends of the earth. Okay? That means we say, okay, we understand that God has given us a responsibility now that is connected to his plan. He's unfolding his plan. And he's given us a responsibility, that is to take the gospel. That's our work right now. Our work right now is take the gospel. God has everything else planned, you know. So the time we have right now is a time to take the gospel to the nations, to the people. That's our responsibility. So we'll be actively fulfilling that. And the last uh, reason, number six, is this prophecy itself the message about the end times the prophecy itself must be preached paul writes in romans chapter 16 verses 25 through 27 he says now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations According to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, be God alone wise, be glory for Jesus Christ forever and ever. So, what is he saying here? He's saying uh, the prophetic scripture is made known to all nations and uh, to bring people to become obedient to the faith. So, the preaching of prophecy, the prophetic scriptures, right? It's it's it should be. The, pro the prophecy of the scripture should be made known to all nations. So this message about the end times is not just for us. Oh, we know, see, keep it secret. No, no, no. The mystery has been revealed. And now we must preach the prophecy to everyone. Hey, announce it. The Bible already says these things will happen. For so what? So that people can come to obey, obedience to the come to Jesus. Right? So even the preaching of the, of the end times, preaching about the end times, preaching about the prophecy of scripture is something we must do. God has unveiled it, he's revealed the mystery, and we must preach it to the nations so that people can come and have faith in Jesus. Right? So it's part of what we also preach to, uh, to bring people to faith. So um, these are some reasons why it's important for us to study about the end times, uh, study about uh, Bible prophecy. Now, um, page number eight in the PDF, our approach in studying the end times. How are we going to study our approach? Some guidance. Right? First, and this is very important, this first point is very important. Take things literally, then figuratively. Okay, and this wherever possible, take it literal. And this is what it said: take it literal. If the literal doesn't make sense, then you say, "Oh, this is figurative. What does it mean?" Right. So, in prophetic scriptures, there are many things that God communicates through 
pictures, figures. Example, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He sees a big image. Uh, and the image, I mean, of course, he tells, first he tells, you know, people, you have to tell me the dream, and then Daniel tells him the dream. He says, oh, king, in your dream, you saw this. You saw an image, the head was of gold. Uh, the chest and the arms was of, uh, you know, of uh, brass, and the thighs, uh, the waist was of different metal, silver. The legs were of, of uh, iron, and, you know, the feet uh, was a mix of iron and clay. And uh, feet and feet and toes, and then there were ten toes. And then there was this big uh, rock, which was not hewn by man's. It was not cut by man's hands. Big rock that came out of the heavens, and it fell on this image, and it crushed the image, and this rock became a big mountain. So King, that was your dream. Oh, yeah, yeah, you said correctly. Right. Now, when you so like that, there are. Uh, lot of pictures, figures. Right? So first thing is, can I, does this mean anything literally or not? Literally doesn't mean anything. There's no meaning to it. Okay. Then we will have to say, okay, it's figurative. Right? Now, when we say something is figurative, many times, the clues to interpreting it is already given in scripture. So, for example, this uh, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel himself interprets it and says, King, the, uh, the head that is shot of gold, that is you, uh, each part of this image represents empires or kingdoms. So, he's, think, he's talking about kingdoms, he's interpreting. Head, gold represents you. Then, the waist, uh, the chest, represents the next kingdom that will come after you. Then after that, there'll be another kingdom, the waist. Yeah. Then the feet of iron, and will come another fourth kingdom. Then this fourth kingdom will, will, will disintegrate, and you know, the iron mixed with clay, with clay, that there will be people from the fourth kingdom who will be mixing with people from all other parts of the world. And in the days of that kingdom, God will set up his own kingdom. So that, that uh, rock coming from heaven, becoming a mountain, is a kingdom that God will set up here on earth. Okay. So what am I saying? First, there is all this picture that God gives. But the interpretation usually is found in scripture itself. We just have to read it. Read it. So in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, 8, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, lot of Daniel sees beasts and animals and all that. We think, oh, what is he saying? What does it mean? Oh, just read on. And he will interpret. He'll say, you know, the bear represents this. The lion represents this. So uh, whenever it's figurative, Use scripture to interpret it, and you'll usually find it within scripture itself. Sometimes it will be in the same chapter or the next chapter, sometimes it may be in some other place. But we have to search within scripture what is the meaning and stay with it. Hmm? Literal, literal means if God says, um. Three and a half years. But okay, take it, take it as literal three and a half years. And I'm, and I'm really explain this. Like um, when we come to you know, okay, the last seven years of tribulation. How do we know it's seven years of tribulation? Because you, you see in many places in Daniel and Revelation, he's saying seven years, seven years, seven years. So then he's okay. He's a literal seven years. Actually, it's going to be seven years. Middle of seven years means three and a half years. It is literal three and a half because middle of the seven is three and a half. So that number we will take as literal. And we don't have to make that figure. 
So you see, so that's the first thing. Second, we do not engage in speculation or sensationalism. That means, you know, um, let us not uh, create some high speculation. Uh, and uh, cause uh, people to get all anxious and so on. See, sometimes when people are preaching about end times, they preach as though Jesus is coming before the sermon will get over. <laughs> he is coming right now. You repent right now. As though before they can finish the sermon, Jesus is coming. Like that, they preach and they create so much of emotion and, uh, you know, hype up. No, we shouldn't do that. I remember, uh, this was some years ago, I think that was 2016, no, I forget exactly which year. Um, but it was the year when um, that particular year, I think there were many, I think a lunar ex eclipse or something where the moon becomes, uh, would be blood, uh, turn red. So a lot of people say, oh, this is blood, uh, blood moon, you know, um, uh, the, because one of the signs would be the moon will turn into blood, so like it become red, blood, not little blood, but moon will become red. There'll be signs in Joel chapter 2 and Acts 2, there'll be signs in the heavens above, the moon will become red, blood. So the blood moon, you know, and the people are writing about it and uh, full that whole year there was full in the Christian world. I think it was 2016 or something. Not, not too long ago. There's so much of uh, everybody around blood moon, blood moon. This year there will be three. There are three blood moons. This Jesus is coming. There's so much of him. Then added to that, that same year, what happened was there were uh, the stars, the particular constellation. That the stars were all being aligned as though there was a woman carrying a child. Okay. Then they said this is the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 12. Because Revelation chapter 12, uh, and we'll explain it, you know, uh, there is the, uh, you know, uh, there's the woman with the man child. Oh, this is the, this is the fulfillment of that. But actually, Revelation 12, if you read that whole chapter, it's very clear. You know, the, the woman represents Israel, the man child represents Jesus, uh, the dragon represents Satan. It's, it's all explained in the same chapter itself. But here, because people were seeing something in the sky, the constellation, oh, you're full. Uh, there were articles and things. Somebody even forwarded me. They said, Pastor, you need to get the church ready. I think it was September, some day they came. That is the day um, this is actually coming into full position. That is the day Jesus will come. You must inform the church, tell them to be ready. <laughs> I literally received that email. <laughs> what are these people saying? Uh, they said, uh, then that person was saying, anyway. That particular Sunday, we are all going to sit in our place very quietly, waiting for the coming of the Lord. Please inform <laughs> like, But that was the hype that was going around everywhere in the Christian world. Now, it is true that uh, that particular year, that particular season, that constellation was all coming together and they were. Those who study astronomy, they say, yeah, it's that woman there and that like woman like that, like a woman carrying a chair. It's only the, the arrangement of the stars that make it look like that. Right? It is true that is happening there. Right? But that has no connection with what this revelation 12 says. This is different. So there's so much of life and you know, then after September came and when October came, now I came here, we are 2024, none of this. So uh, this has been going on for years. And I remember back in 1988, 
so actually maybe it was uh, 1986 or something somebody some american picture he had written a book jesus is coming by 1988 <laughs> the, the title of the book was jesus is coming by 1988 <laughs> that is it began so much uh, hype you know. so this has been going on for many many, many decades you know this thing of creating hype causing people to be uh, very anxious but we want to avoid those things. Right? Study the end times, understand it, be ready. It may happen in our lifetime, or it may not happen. It may happen in the next generation. Okay. But our responsibility is to understand the science and live correctly. Be ready. If Jesus comes today, good. I'm ready. If he doesn't come, I will continue doing my work. First, no need to be full attention. Uh, Number three, the third approach is we are open yet uncompromising. That means we understand that there are people who may have a different view from us on how we are interpreting Bible prophecy. So we are open, fine. If you think differently, if you interpret differently, it's fine. Okay. But we will not compromise on certain things. I mean, there are certain things about the core truth of the scripture that Jesus is coming back. He will have resurrected bodies. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Things that we know for very clearly that we will not compromise. Things that we know, okay, timing, fine, you think like this, somebody else thinks like okay. We can still be friends, you have different opinions. So, so example now, um, there are different positions in interpreting Bible prophecy. Uh, so I've just given in the bottom of page A, I've just listed some of the more important ones. The different people have lots of literally many, many different views. But I just listed some of the more important ones. And just for, for us to know, and I'll tell you the position we will be taking in this course. So there is uh, dispensational pre millennialism. That means um, uh, they look at God's working with people as uh, separate uh, dispensations. One, God's working with. Uh, uh, Israel, God's working with the church, and God is working with them. Uh, and then uh, there is pre millennialism. So that means we are in a dispensation when God's primary working is with the church. Okay. In the Old Testament, God's primary working was with Israel until Christ came. Now, after Jesus came, the church was born. So the current dispensation, that means the current time period, dispensation means a time period. In this current time period, the focus, it is not that God has stopped working with Israel. He still has them. Uh, as his chosen people, they still his chosen people. But this dispensation, right now, we are in what we refer to as the church age. And it's God's primary working is through the church. And the church is in, in this dispensation, this time period, the church has been given the responsibility to do certain things, which is to bring the gospel to all the people, all the nations. Okay. So that is dispensational. So dispensational. Pre-millennialism means we also take the position that the church will be taken out, and the, when the church will be taken out, that will bring it, bring, bring end to the church age. It will bring an end to this current dispensation, this time here. The church will be taken out. Then will come the tribulation. And after that, the millennial reign of Christ. Okay. 
So dispensational pre-millennialism. Pre means the rapture is taking place before the tribulation and the millennium. The rapture will take place. So that's the kind of position we will hold in this course. That means we believe, and I'll explain it later. We believe, and the, the way we will explain also is that the rapture will take place before the seven years of tribulation. Because during the seven years of tribulation, the focus will change back to Israel. Because we read the Bible, or we refer to it as Daniel's 70th week. The seven years of tribulation is referred to as Daniel's 70th week. I will explain why. Okay. Because when Angel Gabriel, this is in Daniel chapter 9, when Angel Gabriel came and spoke to Daniel, he said, Daniel, I'm going to talk to you about 70 weeks concerning your people. And in the 70 weeks, 69 weeks have already been fulfilled. I'll explain this. So one week is left, one week representing seven years. That seven years is the seven years of tribulation. The Bible also refers that seven to that as the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the time when Jacob Israel. Jacob represents Israel. We've been going through a lot of trouble. So during the seven years of tribulation, the focus, and there will be believers, that the gospel will be preached, but a lot of attention will be on Israel and what is happening with Jerusalem. So the church age ends with the rapture of the church, then the last seven years. Then the millennial reign of Christ. The millennial reign of Christ is another dispensation, meaning another time period. It is the reign of Jesus here on the you understand me? I'll we'll go to the chart once again. I'll repeat it. Now there's another another view that is slightly different, which is called um, historical premillennial, yes, where the return of Christ is just before the millennium. millennium. So that means for them, it is that um, Jesus will come at the end of the tribulation, and the end of the seven years of tribulation, which, which, will, which will happen. But that's the time of the that, I mean, the church will be will be will go through the tribulation. So the song of church is not going to be taken out of the tribulation. The church stays through the tribulation. Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation. So that's a historical pre-millennialism. That means they, they believe the church will go through the tribulation, and everything will happen just before the pre-millennium, just before the millennium. Okay, that's one position. Post millennialism means everything happens after the millennium. Post. That means we are the, the thousand years is actually, they say, we are now in the, the thousand years. That means it's like it's not necessarily a literal thousand years as, as we would explain a thousand year reign of Christ. But uh, the God right now, God is rolling, reigning, reigning through the church, and uh, right now the gospel is being preached. So we are already in the millennium, and uh, these thousand years will end, and then Jesus will return. So that's a different position, post millennialism, millennialism, right? and Christ is reigning on the earth through the church, and the gospel is being preached. The uh, another view and, and uh, the uh, millennialism is that um, uh, Christ already has gained victory over Satan. He's already conquered Satan, and uh, so they're not looking at 
a literal um, thousand years. So like, okay, it's not that. It's, you're not looking at it as a literal thousand years. You know, Chris is already conquered. The devil is already conquered. Satan, and he's at the right hand of the Father. He's already ruling and reigning. They're, they're not looking at it as a literal reign among Christ on the earth. It's over. He's already won. So that means they they're not even uh, they don't even believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ. So if you look at the chart on page uh, ten, you look at the chart. So you see what these uh, positions look like. Dispensational premillennialism means uh, the church age. We are right now in the church age. The church age ends with the rapture of the church and then there is a seven years of tribulation as we mentioned and then come the thousand year reign of jesus now even within the pre-millennialism there are different positions some believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church which is the position we will have there are some who believe in a mid-tribulation Rapture of the church is the middle of the tribulation, and some will believe in the post tribulation rapture of the church, which is the equivalent of historical premillennialism. So, historical premillennialism is equivalent to this post tribulation. That means everything is happening at the end of the seven years of the tribulation. The post millennialism or a millennialism. They both don't believe in a literal reign of Jesus on the earth. The post millennialism says that Jesus, from the time Jesus rose from the dead, through the church, he's been reigning on the earth. And uh, the thousand years is not a literal 1,000 year, it just represents an era, a time period. Our millennialism don't even believe in that thousand year reign. They believe Jesus finished everything here uh, after he rose up from the dead. He's conquered the devil uh, and he rules and reigns over everything. Okay, so uh, that's their position. So our response is okay. We will, we will listen to your ideas. We will you know, uh, listen to how you're interpreting scripture. Um, be open to you know uh, understanding or listening to you, uh, but there are some things we won't compromise on, and that, you know things that are very clear in scripture we won't compromise on. Uh, timing, fine, you know that, uh, we understand different people take different timings, uh, but this is our position. We will explain why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, why we hold the position of a, a dispensational premillennialism. Uh, and so we'll explain them as we go. All right. So this chart, we will come back to it. We will kind of get into the details of what's happening. But this chart is useful for us to understand the sequence of events that are going to take place. We'll come back to it and explain it further. Now, I just put the chart here just to help us understand the different positions that people take and um, as far as um, how they interpret scripture. So we're not going to fight over, you know, fight with other people about these things. Okay, we respect their ideas, uh, but we'll also very clearly explain our position, what we believe, and so on. Okay. Um, yeah. A uh, few other thoughts here before we go for the break. Uh, I'm on page eleven, number four. Uh, every time we are uh, when we are studying. Uh, uh, in time scripture, we, we like to look at it with a complete view of scripture. Right? Don't take one passage or one chapter by itself and try to interpret it. No, no. Whatever we do with, uh, with the prophetic scripture about the end times, take all of prophetic scripture and then interpret it. Okay? Otherwise, we just take one portion and try to interpret it. Can, you know, we can go, we can go up into Wrong thing. So we have a complete view of scripture when we interpret it. And we also understand that things that are given to the Old Testament, they are further explained for us in the New Testament. Example, Daniel wrote, you know, Daniel chapter 9, 
actually in uh, Daniel uh, 7, 8, and 9, he writes about this little horn. He first calls it a little horn. Then he talk, uh, calls this man who speaks, you know, uh, abominable things against God. And then he refers to him as a man who comes and he is an abomination of desolation. He comes and uh, desecrates uh, the temple of God. So he gives into this. Then in the the New Testament, Jesus refers back and says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, then you know this is the end. Hmm? So even the Lord Jesus is referring back to that. Paul in his writings, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, he says, ah, that man of sin, the son of perdition. Now he's referring back to what Daniel wrote and he's explaining it further. Then you come into the book of Revelation, John, when he's writing Revelation 13, he refers back to what Daniel said and he explains it further. So, uh, what is given to us in the Old Testament is explained more and more, given more details when we come into the New Testament. And so, we have to put everything together, then we get a good picture. Um, number six is we use biblical typology. So, uh, in the Bible, for example, winds, uh, Daniel says, I saw the four winds. What is winds? So, but he's, the winds are moving upon the sea. What are the sea? Um, then we go to Revelation chapter 17, and then we see that the waters of the sea represents people, multitudes of people. So then we say the winds are the, the things that are moving, the forces that are are moving upon the people or upon the nations, and that means there is some, there is you know there is something that's causing them to think in a certain way, move upon a certain way. So we interpret scripture by staying within scriptures and don't go outside of it. Also, a number seven, recognize different time frames. So that is very important. That in one verse or maybe even in one passage. Different time frames can be referred to. A classic example is in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And of the increase, he continues later, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. So in these two verses, just you know, it is like as the one sentence. But in that one verse, in Isaiah 9, verse 6, in that one verse, there's a gap of more than 2,000 years. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is the birth of Jesus. The government will be on his shoulder. That is not yet fulfilled. 2,000 years have gone. When will the government be on his shoulder? When he comes and he establishes his kingdom here on earth and he sits as king. That is when he's going to be ruling. Government will be on his shoulder. So in that one prophecy, there's a gap of 2,000 years. But if you don't understand the time gap, that timing, then we get very confused. Oh, the child must also be the king. But when Jesus came, he didn't become king. He came to be the sacrifice. So that is how, that is one big reason why the Jews missed him. Because, oh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is born, and the government will be on his. So they're expecting, now oh, you have to take over the government. And that's why even when he was. Uh, being uh, ascending into heaven, the disciples, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And it's, will you change the government now for us? And so it's not for you to know the times and seasons of Father as in his own. So we must understand timelines. Let's pause here and I heard the bell. Let's pause here. We'll come back and uh, take this forward. And we'll also take some questions. Any questions that are there uh, when we come back? Let's pause. Thank you.